Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy, and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team, who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic and my guest today is Dr. Dave Demmer. He is a clinical psychologist with a clinical and research background based on a special interest in mental health within the LGBTQI community. In previous roles, Dr. Demmer has worked in inpatient and outpatient mental health services within private hospital settings and was previously a lecturer at Deakin University. Currently, Dr. Demmer works full-time in private practice, however, remains connected to research and teaching endeavours. Dr. Demmer also has his own podcast named Meet Q. This was a really enjoyable conversation to record as I felt it was really affirming not only for those in the queer community, but also for all of us that identify as human. I hope you enjoy this episode. Dave, a big thank you and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Look, I'm quite excited today to be discussing, you know, mental health in the space of the LGBTQI community or the queer community. It's something I think has brought a lot of uh, attraction or of late in terms of gender and identity and those sorts of things. And, you know, truth be told, I, I would say that I am, you know, myself a little bit challenged by this space in terms of knowing how to navigate it what's what's kind mm-hmm. of reasonable what's not you know it seems like it's a bit of a changing world so i'm really pleased to have you on the show today to discuss some of these things and and much more yeah look i think um a lot of clinicians working in this space uh, can feel exactly like that yeah tell me a little bit about if if if, if you don't mind how you got into this space, you know, what sort of sparked mm-hmm. your interest? What, 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 what brings you, you know, into that focal point of, of, of being really sure. interested in, in, in queer mm. space? Yeah, sure. It, uh, it actually kind of um, happened as a, as a function of um, some other things going on in my world, in my training once upon a time. So uh, this is way back in my fourth year. Uh, honours program <clears throat> when I was selecting research there's actually a supervisor that I really wanted to work with who I'd had a connection in my undergrad with uh, her name was Marilyn Hooley uh, a wonderful a wonderful researcher um, uh, at Deakin University who had a project in fourth year that was based around uh, the development of gender in, in children so particularly kind of preschool age children uh, and I kind of selected a supervisor rather than the project. So uh, it was kind of a function of wanting to work with Marilyn. Uh, and in that fourth year, we put together a really wonderful project looking at um, kind of how children at that age develop a sense of gender. Uh, and back then was, you know, very much looking at kind of some binary stuff around that rather than the more, um, I guess, continue more diverse idea of gender that we, that we um, carry these days. And through that, did a really wonderful project in fourth year, went on to do a doctorate um, also with Marilyn, also again in the space of gender, uh, and with more of a lens on the influence of gender in, in mental health during development. So you know, in a very kind of crude one or two sentence way, my, my doctoral thesis was looking at the um, misdiagnosis, misdiagnosis slash overdiagnosis of externalising disorders um, during middle childhood. So things like ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. Uh, so as a function of that, I was just immersed in the gender world. Um, and then when I uh, graduated my doctorate, uh, went to work um, partly in private practice and myself being a gay clinician, uh, there was a sense that I would often just get referrals from gay men because gay clients can often want to see someone with that lived experience. Uh, and so as a function of that, I also started working in kind of the diverse sexuality space uh, and, you know, when you're working in a diverse sexuality space, it often comes along, obviously, with the gender diverse space as well. Uh, 
And so I guess way back when it was just a function of choosing a supervisor. Um, and then I just kind of fell in love with it as I went along. And I think uh, us as clinicians, as we explore what's right for us uh, and the spaces that we do want to work in, um, it's not just what we're interested in, but also kind of what we feel we're doing some good work in that feels really inspiring for us. And, and I felt that uh, over time I was doing good work in this space and kind of here I am quite a few years later, I guess. Fantastic. And I think there's something really interesting about how we fall into work, you know, when we mm-hmm. kind of examine, you know, where do our interests come from? I know that speaking with lots of, uh, you know, new new clinicians, I always talk about just try and do everything, try and try and uh, expose mm-hmm. yourself and see what sticks. And I know that early mm-hmm. on in my career, uh, my supervisor, uh, um, uh, uh asked me to entertain the idea of, of, of working with couples. And I thought, you know, yeah. Bruce Stevens at the time, I thought he was pretty crazy. Um, uh, but it's it's been an area that I've kind of enjoyed working in. And, and, and so mm-hmm. you just never know. Yet it didn't yeah. didn't feel like it would stick at all and it would feel comfortable at all. And I went, oh, gosh. But mm-hmm. you know, stuck it out and, and then went, wow, this is actually really interesting. Did some training and, and off you go. Mm-hmm. So lovely to hear your story. It's those little suggestions along the way, isn't it, from maybe more advanced or seasoned clinicians that make you, oh, okay, if you're suggesting this. I remember when I first got into private practice, um, one of the directors of that practice at the time, uh, he'd been um, practicing also in kind of clinical hypnosis for a long time. He said, you really need to go do training in clinical hypnosis. I remember thinking hypnosis was never once in my doctorate mentioned i'm not going to go training hypnosis thank you very much um and he really kind of put his foot down around that and i went and did it and again it was just his suggestion and you know i use it quite regularly in my clinical practice Mm. we have a lot to learn from from those from those above us huh yeah absolutely absolutely Mm. tell me a little bit about about this space of you know working in the lgbtqi space what uh, are there any specific areas that are more related from a mental health perspective uh, to mm. that community that might not be experienced by by others? And I'm almost leaning a little bit into the identity sort of work. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that's even valid because I was having a conversation with a colleague recently and I was just thinking, who doesn't go through identity challenges you know where you know I, i've reflected on myself and and you know, i'm a father and you know I'm, I'm i'm identifying as more mature these days and i'm constantly mm-hmm. looking at it and you know maybe as a son as well that potentially will be caring for his parents in the not too distant future like there's mm-hmm. all these different identities that we're grappling with and i i was talking about you know uh, this in particular and i was like I, I was i was asking myself is there a difference you know and and hmm. um uh you know I might hand that yeah. question over o- over to you yeah wow an interesting question uh, let me let me formulate my thoughts on that because i'm sure i've got a million of them um identity in the LGBT kind of plus space, which I'll just kind of refer to as, I guess, the queer community, um, is so inherent to what it means to be part of that community. Um, so someone's sexual identity, someone's gender identity is how we kind of crudely separate out like the two elements of, of the queer community in terms of sexual diversity and, and gender diversity. And I guess the, the, the difference in my mind I would think about would be um, being born into an identity that is assumed. So, for example, uh, when someone might be affirming their gender, um, transitioning their gender, whatever terminology we might use, um, they are, uh, they're kind of letting go of this space of something that was assumed for them once upon a time. Because as a society, we inherently assume someone's gender at birth and we tend to assume their sexuality uh, as well. Uh, and so it's actually inherent of being part of this community um, and then something that they're raised in through a system of family, through a system of society, through a system of schooling, through a system of peers, all that kind of stuff uh, that is actually not inherently who they are. And as people start to recognise that, uh, I guess that's where obviously the real grapple starts to happen. Uh, And the difficulty is that often by the time they've realised that, 
some of the difficult stuff has already happened for them. It might have already started to send them on a trajectory of, of mental health difficulties. Um, you know, the, the kind of classic example when we talk about um, sexual diversity, so, for example, someone being gay, um, and hopefully it's not as common these days, um, but, you know, um, bullying at school, for example. So a lot of my um, uh, sexually diverse clients will talk about this idea of maybe having been called gay as a slur at school and knowing inherently that that was a bad thing to be called, that, that meant you know, there was something wrong with being that. Um, and then over time, once they start to identify that, oh, actually, I am gay, I am same-sex attracted or um, whatever it might be, that, that that kind of early learning in a really key developmental period during childhood has happened and then they're identifying as this thing that they've inherently learnt is bad or wrong. Um, so it's like this awakening to an identity that we've already learnt about what it means and it, you know, it can mean something negative um, from society at times. Hopefully, as I said, we're moving away from that stuff. Hopefully we're moving away from it um, being sexually diverse or gender diverse ever being seen as something that is negative because obviously it's not, um, but it's still out there in society, absolutely. Can you talk us through a little bit about what uh, uh, that diversity means in terms of sexually diverse and, and uh, gender diverse? Sure. So sexually diverse means um, when we are basically a, a sexual identity or sexual orientation that is not heterosexual. Uh, so, for example, same-sex attracted or bisexual or um, even asexual, which is kind of the absence of, of kind of sexual interest. Uh, so there's a diversity other than heterosexual, and that's what we would think of. It's diverse from heterosexual. Um, and then gender diversity, when we have a gender identity that actually is not what was assumed for us at birth. So, for example, um, uh, um, trans man who would have been assumed female at birth and would have most likely lived many years um, as a female gender to then affirm or transition. So affirm is probably the newer word that we would talk about rather than transition, but uh, affirm into a male gender. Um, so it's basically just diverse from whatever your assumed gender was at birth. Does that make sense? And does 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 uh, sexual diversity is is looked at from a heterosexual point of view? It, it doesn't go beyond that, or, or does it, does uh, it not basically look at are you attracted to um, you know, men or women, and obviously depending on your own sex or or are you asexual, or it might even be that you're attracted to someone that doesn't even identify, you know, because at that point we're, yep. we're starting to question, you know, wh where are the – well, not question, ask, uh, how do we define this? So does, does sexual diversity – does it go beyond that? Um, is there um, like a, Yeah, I guess it certainly can, and um, and – I don't, I, maybe I don't necessarily mean to highlight the idea of heterosexual, heterosexuality being like the frame of reference of which we compare everything against. Um, uh, it's more about just being a term that kind of lets someone know that um, my sexuality isn't the traditional heterosexuality. Because sure. um, that's the yeah. most common, right? Because that's the most common, it just becomes by default diverse from that. Yeah, exactly. Is, yeah. Is, yeah. Because it does kind of become the frame of reference and, and certainly, you know, being a firming clinician in the space, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to make it the frame of reference necessarily sure, um, sure. or the comparison yeah. points because um, I feel that would probably be unaffirming. Uh, but it's certainly, um, uh, I guess, sometimes inherently it just automatically does because it's, it's the most common mm. It's so hard this sort of space, and I'll, I'll pick up again on the on the uh, uh, gender diversity. But it's so hard in this mm -hmm. space about trying to pick language that is. Uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, but it, but it, but is reasonable mm -hmm. or is understanding or is compassionate yeah. or accommodating. Can I suggest a word? Uh, please Can I suggest a word. Please. Yeah. So the word that we would probably use is affirming. So affirming. something that is affirming for somebody, um, which means it's support. It's all of those things you're talking about. It's supportive. It's it's 
other person orientated. It's orientated towards them rather than anything about you. So um, you know, that's certainly a word that um, clinicians working in this space um, and you know, people with lived experience in this space are starting to really embrace this idea of affirming. Like I mentioned before, um, that there's this kind of movement at the moment, which I think is really great, away from the more traditional word of someone transitioning their gender. I'm sure you've heard of that before. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when someone transitions their gender, um, there's this idea of uh, they were this and now they've moved towards this. And there's also this idea of almost like a a dichotomy sometimes as well. The idea of, uh, or the word affirm, if someone affirms their gender, and I I really love, I love the use of language. I think it's so important in everything that we do. Um, And particularly love this idea of talking about someone affirming their gender, because it it actually says, well, actually, no, you were never this. You've always been this. And now you're actually having the opportunity to step into it. So it doesn't talk about this idea of you were this and now you're this. It's all about, this is what you've always been. And, and now you actually get to step into that, that part of who you are and that identity. So it respects the fact that they've always been the gender that they've uh, affirmed into. For me, it, it, and just because I'm bound up in my, you know, act, act framework and act comes from relational frame theory is, is the mm-hmm, meaning mm-hmm. of affirming uh, doesn't even ask about that dichotomy. It just says we affirm your choice period yeah. without having to to question anything <clears throat> it says sure we can affirm that just because because you're human you know, there's, yeah. there, there's there's no need to say we affirm it because of this particular reason or trait or identity or or mm-hmm. culture or nationality or whatever it might be because if we affirm someone because they're aboriginal for example or torres strait islander or greek mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. gay or mm-hmm. Yeah, elderly, it can mm-hmm. say something that is unintended. Um, yeah. You know, it, it mm-hmm. almost says, oh, and, and that's only the way I sort of hear it, but I'm a, you know, I suppose we all hear it in a different way. We've all got different hooks. So I like mm-hmm. the word affirming. I can see that that's got a, uh, a real strong um, uh, 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 intent to say non judgment. Yep. Yeah. It also, you know, uh, the movement towards this idea of uh, particularly gender affirming care. Um, I myself identify as a gender affirming clinician, so I, I come from that perspective. Though, you know, unfortunately, it's also caught up in a lot of political stuff um, at the moment as well. Um, if we're affirming gender, then we're doing our best to move away from pathologizing gender because gender is not a pathology uh, someone's gender identity is not a disorder like if we think back to previous iterations of, of um, diagnosis in this area gender identity disorder was the diagnosis which is inherently saying that your gender identity is disordered and you know there's something um pathological or, or there is something disordered about that uh, which obviously we moved away from in, in the release of dsm5 towards gender dysphoria which no longer kind of pathologizes someone's gender identity yeah i think you know i mean one day i hope we get rid of the dsm altogether uh, just because i i thought look I, my apologies i think it's got some great merit and at the same time i think it's got some great challenges and 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 that's because it removes the you know the the context a, a little bit and it's probably not understood to be fair it's probably not understood very well in terms of what the tool should be used as and maybe it's mm-hmm. been exploited in certain areas but um mm-hmm. you know it's actually quite interesting because we kind of exclude out of out of the diagnosis of depression uh grief you know so if someone's experiencing grief mm-hmm. and loss we we don't go and say they're experiencing depression we say they're experiencing grief and so it's not clinically appropriate to say someone has a diagnosis because the context is there but that Mm -hmm. immediately asks the question wait a second isn't there also a context of someone's just broken up from a long-term relationship and they're feeling depressed or maybe even Mm -hmm. grief and loss from that so doesn't Mm -hmm. that go out and explain the context rather than giving them a yeah, yeah. A, a, a diagnosis so that's quite interesting but let me just jump jump across to can you maybe explain a little bit about the diverse gender because that's the one that i think a lot of people struggle with that, that probably gains a little bit of the greater challenges i know the media love to mm-hmm. you know, 
uh, build this one up and 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 it also has yeah. some challenging concepts to to try and and understand and and, and mm-hmm. integrate and so yeah. on maybe it's, you it just certainly talk does our, talk our listeners through what what does that mean and and, and how how do we understand that in an mm-hmm. affirming way yeah um great question and, and you're absolutely right uh in terms of it being something that is you know in the, in the kind of social and public understanding at the moment, but in a very new type of way. And I think that um, anything that enters the public domain uh, goes through a period, unfortunately, of people trying to understand it. And I would hope as, um, uh, as clinicians, we do our best to come from it from an affirming way. But um, so I guess the gender space in, in terms of what I work in is a lot around um, helping somebody understand and explore their gender identity. Again, and from an affirming stance, which is, hey, this this is this is yours. I can I can you know, help you explore it, but it's not ever mine to tell you um, what your like. Never my role to tell you what your gender identity is. It's a really kind of key aspect to, from my perspective, of gender affirming care. Is just like anything. I'm I'm here to help you explore and understand. I'm not necessarily here to tell you who you are, um, and that, that that's not my role. Um, there's lots of different, um, I guess, really important concepts um, for clinicians in this space, not just gender identity, but the idea of gender expression as well, which I think uh, over time we've probably traditionally taken gender expression as a direct link to gender identity. So, you know, I myself identify as a um, cisgendered male um, and therefore there are certain um, traditional male type masculine behaviors and um, uh, ways that I should express that. Uh, but I think as we're developing more in this space, clinicians are really starting to understand, hopefully the general public as well, starting to understand that someone's gender identity does not have to influence or, or even really match up to how they express or show a sense of gender, um, which I think is a really kind of key differential. Um, just because someone identifies as male doesn't mean they act traditionally male in every situation, in every context. Um, The other really important thing, and I kind of touched on it before, um, is the idea of not seeing someone's gender identity as the problem or a problem. Um, The distress that people can feel, which we now term gender dysphoria, the emotional distress that people experience um, because part of their bodies, for example, you know, primary and secondary sex characteristics don't match their gender identity, the kind of difference between that and the distress that causes is what we call gender dysphoria or what we term gender dysphoria. That's what we want to support. And that's the thing that as clinicians, um, we want to be able to provide um, treatment and relief around is the distress that people experience. And there's there's lots of ways that that obviously we do that. That's so beautifully said because I think it comes down to uh, understanding everyone as human beings and still working with one's distress, you know, where mm-hmm. where there might be a void between what someone wants and what they have, and that could be in, at any level. It could be in terms of what job prospects they have, what relationships mm-hmm. they have. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that gender. Financial, you know, uh, um, you know, the situation, their gender, where they mm-hmm. live you know, their social supports, all those things is when, when there's a large void, we, we tend to struggle with that. We, we, we tend to struggle with non-acceptance mm-hmm. in, in that with clinging, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, what we work as at, at you know, in, in psychology is really understanding that and, and negotiating some of that. And it's not necessarily negotiating a change in the actual physical world although there are times where that is appropriate uh, uh, but when it's impossible then we work at the acceptance model and say well if we mm-hmm. can't change it how do we live with it make space for it make room for it identify yep. you know in a different relationship to this tug of war so to speak so mm-hmm. i think, I think I you see your action really training good. coming out there yeah, I know. I can't get away Love from it. it. It's uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, why would you? I'm, I'm why would you? Two, two feet deep. <laughs> yeah, two feet yeah. in. Mm. But yeah, the, the, there's a great challenge at the moment where I I think the unfortunate common 
beat up in, in, in this whole space is, is the community uh, being fed all this sort of uh, great challenge, great, greatly challenged areas like how do we go out and do sport, for example. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm-hmm. it's an area that just gets much, much more headlines and conversation than any of the other areas like we we don't hear nearly as much about mental health as we do in someone wanting to play sport and you know how to do that and and i'm not saying that it's an easy uh an easy thing to to traverse uh but it's like big beat up in one area rather than kind of saying well let's try and 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 you know maybe focus on language let's talk about Mm -hmm. uh, affirming and all these these important things, and also, you know, let's have a nuanced conversation about: Can you actually be affirming to everyone? And you know, mm. psychologists know that's you know uh, it's not not the case. But you know, can you have an intent? Can you try? Can you go out and and, and be thoughtful, compassionate, considered? Um, and you know, uh, unfortunately, I think you know the the conversation gets gets uh, railroaded very quickly with with um you know it does uh, yeah to sell and I think articles absolutely yeah it's a it is a inherently political area um, has been for a little while um, hopefully won't need or shouldn't be you know but hopefully we can um, we can pull that back with greater society understanding um, over time uh, and. It's interesting, like yeah, the, you know, the, the combat about um, about you know trans people in sports, those types of things. It's like, why are we so focused on where we want to exclude people? How do we like? Why are we stuck in these conversations? Why like? And I understand that they're important because there are people who want to exclude certain people, and that's where minority stress comes from, and that's where oppression comes from. Um, and at the same time, it sometimes feels like uh, there's there's some groups of people who you know. Are affirming and are wanting to talk about inclusion, and then the other side of that conversation, other groups of people who are just talking about exclusion without opening up a conversation around inclusion as well. Um, and those two positions just end up so um, um, uh, dichotomous to each other, opposed to each other. Um, that where do we find more kind of places where we are talking about the things that are going to bring bring us together? I think is so crucial at the moment. Uh, I often I often think about. You know, we we had a queer community, a rainbow community, um, which includes sexually diverse people, which includes gender diverse people. And unfortunately, over time, um, sexual diversity has experienced much more understanding and acceptance in the community. Um, and for some reason, gender diversity you know, hasn't had that same traction. It's certainly getting it now. I often think that like, gender diversity is up to you know twenty years behind where sexual diversity is. Um, and so we've got a long way to go in that space. And um, uh, it's just really unfortunate to see the challenges and the continued oppression in, in the space. Mm-hmm. Talk me through a little bit about the trends that you've seen in your clinical work in terms of the queer community coming in for support. What are the types of areas that are, uh, are showing up most often for you um you know obviously we're focusing on you know the identity sort of space but it must be far broader than that you know what 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 patterns are you seeing and and obviously you know we're not saying that this is the rule of thumb or anything like that but but just in your Mm -hmm. clinical experience sure so i guess me as a clinician the things that i see and i'll just talk from my experience in my practice um uh certainly within within the gender space it's gender dysphoria. It's a lot of people wanting to explore their identity, but um, a lot of people also coming in who are very affirmed in, in their gender and, and uh, um, are feeling very solid in who they are and have done that exploratory work. And that can then unfortunately open the door to the dysphoria. Um, so once I you know, really recognise that I am gender diverse and this is who I truly am, then all of a sudden I've got this frame of reference of how people treat me and what people call me and what my body looks like and feels like that is then 
and um, often at the other end of, of where my actual gender identity is. So lots of gender dysphoria. I see a lot of clients as well, uh, gender diverse clients who are going through some sort of medical affirmation process. So be that starting um, gender affirming hormones, so HRT, um, or um, about to go through gender affirming surgery um, uh, to assist with like appropriate changes to their body to be able to be, um, for it to be more in line with their affirmed gender. In terms of sexual diversity, um, I work predominantly with the G within the LGBT community, so um, a lot of gay men. Uh, some of the more kind of common things that I see in that space are um, some internalised homophobia, what we might term gay shame. Uh, so struggles having, as I said um, at the beginning, kind of struggles growing up in a heteronormative world uh, and kind of then finding a place in that or recognising that that's not them and those kind of early experiences of being called gay or whatever it might be, um, uh, struggling with some internalised shame about their sexuality. Uh, also, you know, I work a fair bit in, uh, in the addiction space, uh, predominantly with uh, crystal methamphetamine, which unfortunately is, is, um, can be fairly prominent in the gay male community. Uh, so uh, they're, they're probably some of the, the main areas that, that I specifically work in and the trends that I see. But then maybe it's just a function of the fact that I work in those areas that I then get those referrals. <laughs> well, look, I, I would like to hope that that is why, because in actual fact, we know that, you know, therapy is somewhat of an equation of, of the therapeutic alliance relationship that, and trust that, that can be built. So it's, 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 you know, I know I get a lot of, uh, when I was you know, consulting, I get a lot of Serbian, well, not a lot, but I, I get certainly get my fair share of Serbian community because I have that language and, you know, there's a local GP that is, you know, works with, with the Serbian community and if they don't have language, who do they talk to? And so I'm one of only probably a small handful of, of uh, clinicians who actually have that capacity for, for language so they come and immediately... Yeah there is an understanding and no different to you have a language that that uh, is mm -hmm. much more uh, skilled than than i do with the queer community and so mm -hmm. you know it would take me some time to catch up um you know mm -hmm. and probably never uh, uh, meet your standard because you would see a higher volume of, of of the queer community than than i do at present so mm -hmm. you know it's fantastic because that's that's a service that we want to be available uh, exactly. No different too, whether it's relationships, whether it's young persons. Mm -hmm. There are different language sets that come up, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in all populations. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's not easy for people to to find their clinician, let alone in a particular nuanced area that's important to them. Exactly, and and you know, vice versa with populations, um, you know, in Serbian populations. I'm certainly not an area I've worked in or, or identify as. So um, uh, it goes both ways, doesn't it? I think there's something inherent uh, or something to be said i should say about um clients who want to come in to someone with that lived experience i think it can be really important for a lot of people and it doesn't necessarily mean that the therapy changes it doesn't necessarily mean anything around what we actually do it's more about maybe being able to help them feel a little bit more safe or, or a little bit more understood or you know i know i've certainly had um clients i've maybe done some screening over the phone with um, to see if they were right for me and they will make comments like, oh, I just, I just don't want to have to explain what this is or, you know, I want someone when I use this term to just inherently know what that means. Um, and that's, as I said, not something that's changing the therapy. I'm not suddenly going to move from, you know, CBT to schema or ACT or something. It's more about the relationship um, and then being able to feel safe in that space. And I think also too, um, and I'm sure it's inherent to lots of minority populations, but I think myself as a gay clinician, and, and you know, I certainly don't hide the fact that I'm a gay clinician, and I'm sure most of my referrals already inherently know that I'm gay or can make a strong assumption that I am. Um, a lot of people in this space, particularly working with gay men, can um, struggle to have safe connections and be vulnerable with other gay men. And so in that, I'm able to provide that type of relationship, therapeutically, of course, um, where they can get to know another gay man, where they can be vulnerable with another gay man in a room, where they can um, talk about sex or drugs or family or you know, things they don't um, appreciate about themselves or their body or any of those things with another gay man and be held, you know, be held compassionately and empathetically, I hope. Yeah. Mm. 
how much how much would you say uh, 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 let me rephrase it uh, how frequently do you see that comorbidity around drug drug use you said that there is a fairly um, reasonable correlation well, not correlation but uh, connection there um, sure. uh, is that is that fairly prevalent uh, you know is and obviously not trying to run numbers but you know, in your in your experience, I can give you some if you want them. I know. Oh, I'd there. love it if there are. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't, want, I didn't want to put you on the spot and say, "Okay, Dave, give us give us the percentages yeah. in 2000." And <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, I can give you the percentages from 2020, um, which are you know specifically around uh, crystal methamphetamine. Um, uh, roughly about 15 percent of gay men report having used crystal methamphetamine in the last six months, as opposed to 1.3 percent of the general community. Um, so. That's a pretty, or 1.8%, sorry, maybe I didn't know it off the top of my head. It's 1.3 or 1.8, but there is a significant, um, uh, significantly, you know, statistically significant um, uh, higher usage within within the gay male community. Um, so it's it's common. It's certainly not with the majority of, of my clients, um, but it's certainly common enough that we would consider it to be a pretty important issue to be addressing within within the community, uh, and it's not always just, of course, crystal methamphetamine. It's you know, there's a there's a plethora of other substances that people can um, can start to struggle with over time that that I also see. Hmm. Any any research around why it's crystal meth, or you know, I'm, I'm assuming that's a higher rate period in terms of drug use than the general population. Um, uh, that that you know, is, is being used in, in, in the queer community? <clears throat> yeah, so um, crystal methamphetamine specifically and probably more um, generally substances of addiction, um, I guess there's lots of, lots of theories around it. Um, you know, one that I'm often coming from in terms of the clients that I would see uh, would be it, that internalised homophobia slash gay shame um, uh, approach where... But even at a subconscious level, there's a real uncomfortability to be able to connect, particularly sexually, um, with other men, um, because, um, for lack of a better term, what proves you're gay more than having sex with another man? Um, and so there might be a lot of shame and discomfort in sexual experiences, and therefore, you know, obviously, you're not feeling that when you're on crystal meth. Um, so I should say, um, for those who might not know the relationship, there's a very, 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 very strong relationship between crystal meth um, and amphetamine in the gay community, crystal meth and amphetamine and sex. Um, so not, not everyone is using it um, for sex. I'd, I'd probably suggest that I could count on one or two hands the amount of clients that I've seen of, of the many, many, many where there wasn't a strong connection with sex so it's it's quite often used for um uh for sexual activity with other gay men and so if the shame around that type of activity then you're not feeling that when you're on crystal meth you're feeling fantastic you're you know, you're flying you are um uh, you know, you're, you're full of confidence and and um you're full of positive emotions for the you know, thousand times dopamine hit that you're getting when you're when you're using so we're not quite sure why uh, there, that that connection is there. I mean, I, I've never used crystal meth, but I can only assume it's incredible. If you know mm -hmm. people are drawn to it, it must give you some incredible high and and mm -hmm. really elevate whatever feeling you're having at that at the time. And whether Absolutely. it's sex at the time, or whether mm -hmm. it's I don't know dancing with other people mm -hmm. and, and feeling mm -hmm. connected, or um, mm -hmm. I imagine it's just the social connection there. I I, I feel like. Um, uh, it would have to accentuate some certain things to make it so attractive that you keep going back to it. Um, yeah. Well, addiction kicks in, doesn't it? Because I know some drugs are very, very solitary. Others are, are very you know, social. And I, I believe mm. you know, from my understanding, at least is that, is that, you know, uh, crystal meth is, is, is fairly social that people use it and then they engage with others, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that I just yeah. use it alone and, do their own thing in yeah, look, so, some people certainly do. Um, it's probably, I'd suggest, more common, um, you more commonly used uh, in sexual activities with other people. Um, certainly, people who do use it um, independently. Um, uh, I think it's also, you know, not just the shame element and and um, 
have been able to engage sexually with someone and not feel ashamed because the crystal meth is covering that. There's also, um, because it is so prominent in the community, it's, it's, you know, for lack of a better term, never that far away. And so it's actually quite easy when you think about this 15% versus, you know, 1.3, 1.8, I can't remember which one it was, um, uh, that you are more likely to encounter someone else who is potentially, um, uh, you know, engaging in it or happy to engage in use. Uh, and therefore, it's going, to be, it's going to be more accessible for you. It's mm. almost like smoking, right? If, 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 if uh, you know, 15% of the population is smoking, it's so much easier to say, oh, I'll, I'll try it. Give me a drag, yep. and you know, yeah. a drag is much more than, than than zero. And so, once you've had a drag, it's much easier to have a second drag. Exactly, and, and, exactly. And off we yeah. go, and and obviously, you know, once you've had something that uh, you know is is enjoyable, and I'm, I'm assuming is reinforced with enjoyable activities and social relationships, the, the, at least the potential for you know a, a future use is heightened. Absolutely. And look, the addictive nature and addictive quality of, of um, any type of amphetamine, but, you know, crystal methamphetamine is, is um, so significant. It's off the charts. I mean, the, um, uh, I think it's like a thousand times, as I said before, the dopamine hit of, of um, the typical dopamine hit. I mean, that's huge. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want that in some way? Um, it, uh, as you said, I'm sure it's a wonderful, you know, intense feeling. It's the, difficulty and the devastation and, and all the other stuff that can come along, obviously, as we know, with addiction that um, uh, that gets a lot of people into a lot of trouble, unfortunately. I uh, hope I don't go too personal now, but I'd, I'd like to ask you a question as a clinician and, and obviously identifying as a gay, gay man, um, mm-hmm. you're going out and supporting others. Do you hear... <clears throat> others uh, in a certain way do, do, does any of their um their own lived experience resonate for you do you have any of your own struggles uh, and and obviously you know whatever you're open and willing yeah. to, to, to 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 share but uh, i know that you know if i think about my my clients you know more often than not i feel so much of of what they're discussing in myself and and mm. um you know sometimes the question arises, at least in my mind, uh, you know, who should be sitting in which seat? You know, there's, like, sure. there's, there's plenty of times where where I think we could swap swap seats, and um, because what I'm hearing is almost a reflection of of myself, and and mm-hmm. um, it doesn't mean that I can't still be, you know, very much objective and do my do, do my role in terms of s- support, but uh, you know human being first you know there, there, there's a lot to relate to but certainly in some areas whether it's a being a young father for example I, I feel like i can relate to some of those specific challenges it's very mm-hmm. dependent on where i am in my life you know mm-hmm. um uh, how do, do, do you experience those sorts of things what's it been like in in, mm-hmm. in your own um you know identity you know working in this space and obviously becoming uh, a, a great support for for the queer community. Mm. Wonderful question, and, and I'm an open book, so it's absolutely fine that you would ask that. Uh, do I identify with you know with clients at times? Absolutely, I am you know, a gay man who was raised um, you know back in the the 90s and the early 2000s as a teenager, and um, <clears throat> Uh, I certainly went through periods of, of struggling with my sexuality, so I, I absolutely understand what what that's like. Um, did a lot of therapy, as I you know, as I believe in any. I'm a firm believer that any any clinician should have sat in that chair, bef- you know, um, before they've sat in this chair to understand who they are and what they bring into the room. It's an inherent part of what I do. Right? I would say that I work in a space that I have lived experience in. And there's really kind of no escaping the fact that sometimes I'm going to resonate with some stuff that clients are saying. Um, I also think that it adds this extra little bit of um, not just understanding, but like empathy in those types of situations uh, where, you know, as, as clinicians, we're like, yeah, I get it. I get it. I understand. And sometimes we're like, oh, boy, do I get it. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I understand um, when it's actually your lived experience. So I probably get that maybe a bit more than clinicians who aren't working in a lived experience type of space for them. Um, and 
I would say on the spectrum of, of a clinician who um, appropriately and within ethical boundaries discloses and doesn't disclose, um, I think that when it's clinically appropriate and, of course, ethically appropriate, um, I will sometimes use that to be able to really help a client. Um, <clears throat> and with their permission, I always ask permission, um, uh, understand that, hey, this, this is a shared experience. Um, this is something that I get. This is something I understand. Um, and I actually think it's a really powerful part of my, part of my work. Um, so I, I don't turn away from the fact that at times I'll get it and I get you know, lots of supervision as, as we all do um, and lots of support around process stuff that's going on for me that isn't appropriate to bring into the clinical space. Uh, I actually really cherish that part of, part of my work. Um, and I think it makes me, a, it makes me, it, it enhances my, my abilities and my skills in the area that I've got that there. Mm. How, do, how did you work on, and certainly not trying to pry into your own clinical uh, experience, but how did you, uh, how did you um, work through that? Uh, I mean, in some sense, if I can, if I can call it, mm-hmm. moving from needing affirmation from the world mm-hmm. to self-affirming, Mm. And not that that's the only piece of the puzzle, but but how did you work on 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 that for yourself? Because I'm I'm assuming in in when when I think about it from an identity perspective, you know, if someone is of a weight that they're not happy with, uh, often the solution is certainly not weight loss, uh, because someone can go out and lose weight or gain weight depending on what what mm-hmm. they're unhappy with, yet. Mm-hmm. The remnants of that dissatisfaction is still there. That that that, that affirmingness of, of who they are, that they're good enough, still isn't there, mm-hmm. irrespective of the the, the physical body change. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that for us uh, as clinicians, we're really trying to to work with someone's love of themselves, affirmation of themselves, of of, of acceptance and and, and compassion mm-hmm. and kindness. Um, how did you do that? For yourself personally yeah 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 uh who was you know therapy helped absolutely therapy helped um uh, i think i was in a very do i say lucky or privileged position i'm not sure that uh, i recognized or i recognized that i was gay very very early like in in mid-primary school i i recognized that there was something different about me in terms of um, my attraction. Um, But I think the key or the difference was, and this is where I guess the luckiness comes in, I understood what it meant. Like I knew, yeah. So a lot of clients will talk to me about this idea of, oh, yeah, looking back, I can see it. Yeah, like I had this best friend and, you know, I always wanted to hang out with them and, and it wasn't until I was an adult that I went, oh, that was because, you know, there was, there was some sort of kind of connection that I felt or some sort of draw that was about my sexuality but they don't maybe don't realise that until adolescence or um, adulthood. I knew what it meant then. I knew what gay meant. I, I understood what that would mean for me in my life and et cetera. Doesn't mean I accepted it then. Doesn't mean that I didn't go through a period of, of struggling with it back then. But it meant that the struggle period for me happened very, very early in my life, um, you know, through late childhood, early adolescence. So by the time I was reaching mid-late adolescence, even to adulthood, I had gone through the period of pushing it away, of feeling shame about it. Um, And that meant for me that once I hit the age where it might be expected that you're starting to date or become sexually active and those types of things in in late adolescence, um, I'd already kind of affirmed who I was and knew who I was and and pretty much come out. Um, So I then never had to um, luckily, you know, live a double life where I knew who I was in terms of sexuality, but then had to pretend that I was something different. Yeah. Um, so I'm always really thankful that for whatever reason, it's not like I necessarily came from the most progressive home where gay rights were discussed or anything like that. I just, for some reason, knew early on um, what it meant. And therefore my, my processing of that happened incredibly early. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, you know, like like any human being, there were things along the way that were difficult. And I moved from you know, a small town 
down on the coast up to the, you know, big scary Melbourne and, and got to kind of really step into who I was, um, probably stepped even a bit further than was actually me and, and um, kind of had to wind myself back a little bit and find who I really was. I kind of slingshotted into a, a particularly gay life, if you want to say that, and then kind of had to eventually step back and find where my actual place was. Um, I think, yeah, moving moving to Melbourne when I was 18 was uh, was really fundamental in that in that process as well, as well as finding who, I, finding who I am, yeah. And can I tell you, sometimes, even, even for me, as, as lucky as I've been, there are still moments where I notice it pop up for me. Um, uh, I, was in, I was in a cafe the other day, um, quickly my story, I was in a cafe the other day and uh, I was talking to someone down the road from where, um, where my practice is and I said something about my partner and the person behind the counter said, um, you know, blah, blah, oh, what does she do? And I felt this little like, oh, like I felt this, just this little twinge of like, oh, oh God, uh, this uncomfortability of having to kind of correct them. Um, so, you know, even for people who work in this space, even for people who have been affirmed and out, out you know, them, um, over half their life now for the past 20 years, um, it, still, it can still be there at times. Mm. Mm. It's, it's interesting because as you talk, I know going through, uh, becoming a father, there, there, there's a real challenging time where it's very um, scary to talk about kids because there are people who are trying to uh, get pregnant and some mm. are able to, some are not able to, and this whole assumption of do you have kids, you don't realise until you're in that space of how sensitive that is and so your language begins to to shift, um, mm-hmm. you know, or you don't necessarily assume that everyone's trying uh, or that they want to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so th- there's these nuances that come up, come along. And so when you say, you know, what does she do or where is she or whatever it might be, there's, mm-hmm. there's an immediate assumption rather than I think, you know, I think we're getting uh, better and probably with maturity and age that, that we don't assume things, that we don't go out and assume, for example, mm-hmm. that, even even assuming that you, you know, are partnered with a female, how about the you know even assuming that uh, uh, someone is married or not married or yep. you know what, what, mm. whatever the scenario is like we assume that people who are together live together. So why not mm-hmm. everyone mm-hmm. who is mm-hmm. together lives mm-hmm. together? And then we can do oh when are you guys going to move in? So, yeah. Really, and yeah. <laughs> these can be such sensitive things, right? You know, where where you know it might be that one person desperately wants to live with their with their partner, and the other person doesn't. So, or you know, or maybe someone's got several partners. You know, they're in an mm-hmm. open exactly. Yeah, all these assumptions are, are, are very very complicated. But uh, wow, it, it 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 just shows that um yeah the 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 challenge of being human and trying to be kind and nice. And I'm assuming it was just a nice throwaway. Well, not throwaway. It was a nice um, absolutely gesture yeah. of let's just comment. I'll, I'll just inquire about, about you. Cause you know, that yeah. kind of have, has, has come mm. up, but uh, we accidentally mm. kind of, you know, uh, step in it, so to speak. Yeah. And look, his intention, uh, you know, the guy served me the coffee, his intention was to be inquisitive and curious and get yeah. to know me and, and just be generally a nice person who, you know, is trying to attract business back and buy another coffee tomorrow and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it comes from a place not only of me being like, oh, I have to correct myself here. It's, it's interesting. It's this um, it's this concept that we talk about in, in uh, the sexually diverse space and maybe in some aspects in the gender diverse space as well around we don't just come out once. Like that was me having oh, to come okay. out again. That was 15-year-old me, you know, having to come out again. Um, that there is always this inherent assumption, assumption that you are heterosexual and, um, you know, depending on, on how you might present, there's an inherent assu- assumption about your gender as well. Mm. Uh, and so this process for people is continuous throughout their life. Mm. It's funny, uh, ju- just on the weekend, um we, uh, I went camping with 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 uh, a bunch of friends, and one of my really good friends, his son has long hair, mm-hmm. and uh, and you know they're I'm not sure how old he is now, but let's let's call it sort of five years old or thereabouts, and uh, they're at the playground, and and naturally, um, you know who gets teased and what are they teased for? Right. Well, 
of course you can't be a boy and have long hair because boys don't have long hair. Um, and that's a classic thing that he's going to experience, um, you know, more, more likely than, you know, than, than not throughout his schooling if he maintains his long hair. Uh, interestingly, his, you know, his dad has long hair and uh, you know, quite an attractive man. Um, uh, by all accounts, uh, you know, uh, is, is and you know, lovely, lovely human being. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, it's interesting to observe how this is just everywhere. You know that, that mm-hmm. We, mm-hmm. we 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 should really maybe say that you know human beings are diverse. You know, not not just sexually, not just gender, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Uh, you know, across the across you know those five big big five personality traits and some. You know, and 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 maybe mm-hmm. when we remove categorization, DSMs, that that we can, mm-hmm. we can start from a different place and and uh, uh, and still be compassionate with one another. But that doesn't mean that lived experience mm-hmm. doesn't also assist with 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 understanding others, um, and hopefully it translates so that you know uh, being you know diverse in a uh, in one area. Can maybe allow you to also appreciate that we're all diverse because everyone's diverse in an area. You know, my yeah, my parents are migrants, so um, mm. you know, my diversity was that I didn't wasn't given an opportunity to read books. Uh, my apologies, uh, my parents were not able to read books to me, and right, so okay. yeah, you know, I watch my my daughter in a very different space and so on. But we're all diverse in very different ways, and maybe that's the mm. bit of a takeaway. Um, from from today and yeah i guess it it then relates to the kind of level of what we would term minority stress that gets um kind of laid on on that diversity uh which i think is is so inherent in in what we need to consider i'm i'm so thankful that i'm sexually diverse i wouldn't have it any other way um because i think that it has framed my development and understanding of the world and how i see um, difficulties and how i see other people in a way that I'm always, and I don't know, because I've always been gay, um, uh, what it would have been like if I wasn't. And would I have been as socially aware? Would I have been, because I you know, loved where I grew up and, and, and you know, wonderful family, but I came from a small town where there, there wasn't, you know, certainly any outward diversity that anyone espoused. Uh, as far as I knew, I was the only gay kid in town. Um, uh, how it would have been if... I, I didn't inherently have to consider what it meant to be diverse. Mm. Mm, mm. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful. How can people get in contact with you? Obviously, you're in Melbourne. Um, yes. Whether it's someone wants to, to, to see you from a clinical perspective or, or, or mm-hmm. you know, connect in, in other ways, how do people get, get in contact? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, I am the founder and director of Wellington Street Psychology in St Kilda here in Melbourne. Uh, myself and my wonderful, wonderful team um, uh, focus on the LGBTQIP plus community. Uh, so that's kind of the predominant um, work that we do and, and we're wonderfully skilled in that in that space. So wellingtonstreetpsych.com or, you know, you can simply type my name into Google. It will come up somewhere along the lines or, you know, please feel free to um, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a message. I'm always happy to have to connect um, uh, with people. Uh, we also have uh, a podcast that we um, have just finished season one for and yesterday had a planning session for season two. Uh, so I encourage people when they are... <clears throat> at this point when they're considering if I might be the right clinician for them to actually listen to some episodes of the podcast. Um, so it's called Meet Q. So meet and then the letter Q. And um, basically it's myself and, and, and mental health GP and, and another clinical psychologist who um, each episode we, we hear from um, a fictional person named Q who gives us a bit of a snippet into their life and their difficulties. And then we just sit, sit around and have a bit of a chat about how we would kind of understand and support Q. Um, and it's all about obviously people in the LGBT space. So I encourage people to listen to a couple of episodes to get a bit of a feel of who I am and how I practice and what you might expect from me because it all kind of comes out in, in, in the podcast. Podcast. It's a really great way to kind of try before you buy at this point. <laughs> yeah. Where can people listen to Meet Q? Uh, so it's on um, everywhere you get your uh, everywhere you get podcasts. So uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, all the others. They're probably Brilliant. the two main that that people consume. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Mm-hmm. And do you also see 
uh, uh, clients that don't identify in the queer community or you specifically mm-hmm. want to make that, you know, your time available for that specific population because there's not too mm. many services available for, for them? Yeah, no, look, I, I certainly do. It just turns out that the people, I guess, who typically want to come and see me want me for those types of things. But I inherently have the belief that if I'm the right clinician for you and, and we both feel that, then then that's the most important thing, isn't it? I mean, we know that the best, you know, that the, um, the most helpful part of any therapy is the connection that you feel with your therapist and how safe you are in the room and, and uh, the relationship that you have. So not, not necessarily, that's just predominantly the space that I work in, but if I'm the right person for you, then, then by all means, I'm the right person for you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dave. Really appreciate your time to have a good good conversation about about this space without all the nonsense and craziness that 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 we hear and and really trying to understand mm-hmm. how to meet human needs in in a respect, respectful and affirming way. I think mm-hmm. it's a definitely a, a takeaway for me. Um, yeah, you know, I, I haven't used the word affirming very often in my vocabulary, and I think I'll I'll, I'll be taking that away. Uh, in my own, you know, not only clinical practice, but, you know, uh, in, in, in just life. I, I think there's something nice about that that really deep understanding that I mm-hmm. am okay with who I am or the decisions I make or I'm living mm-hmm. my life, not someone else's. But thankfully my yeah. life is very much integrated with my values, which does include other people as well, but it's affirming to, mm-hmm. to a greater you know, value system, belief system, and the like. So, um, mm. really appreciate your time, and and uh, wish you all the all the best in in your work, and and hope you can uh, you know grow and and continue that practice for particularly the uh, queer community. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm it's an absolute pleasure to be here, and and uh, I really appreciate any time that uh, clinicians in this space want to shine light on diversity and particularly the queer community. It's such a passion of mine and it's um, these types of conversations hopefully continue to drive this positive change in the space. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe, share it via social media and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out i'd love to hear from you